Jeremiah is back. We're on 5 uh, A uh, 1.20 or so. Uh, uh, it, I might change the numbers, but right now, and we're going to talk about baby baby faith. We're going to talk about the, uh, the Christian faith and, and, and what are some of the main ideas for you babies out there. Now remember, we who have been Christians for a long time, these scriptures are still applicable to us. Why? Because we went through these. And some of these scriptures refer to not just getting started in Christianity, but your entire life of confidence and persuasion. And you trust in the Lord. And these are your convictions you stand by. Okay, so we don't leave these scriptures. It's just that most of them are applicable to people who are just getting involved and who are new converts, okay? So let's look at some of these scriptures that talk about baby steps for Christians in your walk in faith and your belief. That you're, you're learning how to put confidence in reality. You're learning how to put confidence in the spirit world and in love and truth. So the first one is, come unto me, all you. So there you go. That's the yoke scripture. You're supposed to come to the Lord first. That's uh, 2.1 on my playlist. You got to go to the Lord. Everybody. Repent and be baptized. That's easy. Turn back to God and bury your ideas of what reality are. Because you're lost. This is the truth. Realign yourself with reality and the truth. And if you say this isn't the truth, then you're a liar. That's what you are. Confess your sins at the River Jordan. Go, go, go see John the Baptist. Confess your sins to the priest, to the, uh, the pastor, and in a, in, in a Protestant church that has a King James Bible in there. If you can't find one, you keep looking and praying. Some of you are living uh, on plateaus that are far from me. I, you know, I don't know where you live. You might be Chinese, Wan Ying, I don't know. You might be in Africa, that's Karibu. You could be in Vive la France, at the, at the Eiffel Tower. Beyond the new. So I don't know where you are. But if you can't find a Bible teacher and you found me, then you found uh, a gentleman, gentleman, gentleman who has the time and the energy to teach you a whole lot. I have 500 videos under Jeremiah Michael Pearson. And under this new format, I'll have 500 here in no time, if the Lord doesn't come back. And we say that with a very sad tone of voice, because we went out of here uh, big time. This world is getting very ugly in 2022. It's the, end, it's, it's the end times. But we can be encouraged because what's the personality of the person that we love and serve? Who's adopting us? Father God. Well, what's his personality? We just looked at it in Matthew 5 and in uh, John 14. Those are two of the best places to go and find the personality of God written down on paper for you. That there is no evil, there is no harm, that, that God can't even think about doing any harm to anybody. Now, he does put out justice, but he just lets it happen. He, 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 he's obviously not uh, uh, desirous of, of, of justice. That's why the rainbow is out there that you can see in the sky. The rainbow is a sign from your Bible teaching you Jesus Christ that he, he wants to be merciful. He wants to go ahead and say, forget about it. I know you sinned, but I'm going to give you mercy. And that's going to be my personality. That's what the rainbow means. Amongst other things. Let's continue with those who are being uh, illuminated and, and their introduction. Confessing your sins at the River Jordan. Being sorry for your sins, where God descends at Bethabara, 
Hear ye him. And what is that? That's 2.2 on my Richter scale here in the playlist. 2.2. Honor the Son even as you honor the Father. That's deity understanding. That's playlist 21. When you first become a Christian, you should be told that you're to honor the Son even as you honor the Father. I had a gentleman who didn't do that, and he almost got in trouble. I'm not going to go into that right now. You have, a, have the faith of a mustard seed. A mustard seed starts out very small, but the plant gets big. That's what's going to happen to you. When you put confidence in a good organization that's going to build you up, then that's a good idea. That's a good analogy of joining the right team, and before you know it, you're big and you're big. Uh, you're a big part of the team. Although you started out small. I started out small as a Bible as a Bible student, and look at me now. I'm teaching the, the, the new covenant of Jesus Christ. But I started out small. I had to listen to the Bible teachers. So now I'm an under shepherd. Let's continue. So you're going to end up like Zipporah. Moses' wife's name was Zipporah. It means high and pora means bird. A high flying bird. So you started out on the bottom and you ended up flying on the mountaintop with, with Zipporah. The high flying bird. But you started on the ground. Jesus said when you go to a, a dinner, take the low table. When I go to a dinner or somewhere, I want the lowest table. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted or lifted up. That's basic Christianity. Old Testament and new. Blessed are you who, who love the Lord first. That's the key here. Daddy comes first here. Number one, numero uno. We can go to Matthew 10, for that since I'm in Matthew. Matthew 10, 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me. Stop the train. That's the same thing as love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we do that by doing what? According to this text. For you young Christians, take up your cross daily. Put on a servant mind. Jeremiah, you're always saying, uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the word servant is so... The word servant and we just put the devotion and devotee. Uh, those two words are ginormous. Because devoted means that your heart's involved. And servant means that we have actions to prove that your heart's involved. Da, 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 da. Devoted means I, I, I made a vow to serve the Lord and love the Lord. And, and service is the action that proves that I love. And I, I mentioned a thousand times here, that's exactly what my parents did. My parents didn't talk very much. Actions speak louder than words. I, I watch TV and, and, and commercials on the web, and they go, I love my Subaru, I love my cat, I love my hot dog, I love my mustard, I love my house, I love my car, I love the tree. And, and, and they're doing everything wrong because they didn't say they love daddy. That's the problem. What are they doing? They're antichrist. Aren't they? That's what they are. Christ is. Father told me to. Father told me to go die for Jeremiah. We, we, we were just on that profound uh, chapter, John 14. And you can go back to this chapter over and over again because this has a lot of cornerstone ideas for the Christian faith. And, 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 and let's go to uh, 14, uh, 31.
but that the world may know that I love the Father. There you go. We're, we're right back to square one again. The Christian faith is for you to please God and to be confident that pleasing Daddy is the best road to take. That's what the Master is saying here. The Father wants me to please Him, and I'm going to do that because I love the Father. That's it. Jesus is compliant with the number one command to love Daddy. He, he's articulating it, he's thinking about it, and he's devoted to it. A devotee, that's what he is. He's a servant right there in your, in your face, boots on the ground, I will serve Daddy, and end of story. Daddy said jump, I said how high. Even to the point of dying for Jeremiah, who is not worth dying for, uh, Father told me to go do that and suffer horribly for Jeremiah. So it's easy for a Christian man who sinned against God to love the Lord. Because our brain is thinking about this. 1431. I don't think I have a high intelligence, and I can figure out what the Master is saying here in John 14, 31. Boots on the ground. Daddy commanded me to go save Jeremiah, and I know he's not worth anything, and I'm going to go do it. It's the same thing we're learning here now, is to serve the Lord now, even though there may be a lot of difficulties involved. I'm going to take up my cross, and that's what, that's what love is. Back to Matthew 10 again. He that loveth his life will lose it. He that loses his life and hate it shall find it. We're here to wake up every morning and say, Lord Jesus, give me my daily bread. What do you want me to do today that I might help others like, the, like my master did for me? Jesus could have went to a party if he wanted to. No, he, he went to a cross of pain for me. So therefore, he's, he's easily lovable based upon this criteria. It doesn't take any uh, uh, concentration uh, uh, much at all, does it? No. So blessed are you who love the Lord. Want to be happy? Get on your knees, get back in line, soldier up, and get the love. Soldiers get love. Wimps don't get love. Christianity can be a little tough. And the Master says, and he who taketh not up his cross, 1037, and he that taketh not his cross. Okay. Some people are not going to take their cross. They're going to hear about Jesus Christ, but they're not going to take up their cross. And the previous scripture says, love me. So two and two is four, four and four is eight. Loving him is taking up your cross. Loving him is serving him and being open and yielding to being a servant with your, with your body and your mind and, and, and your concentration. I'm going to concentrate on being a servant. I'm going to concentrate on taking up my cross. And that means that I am love compliant to the number one command, I do indeed love the Lord. Is that difficult to understand? No, it is not. I've had people tell me that they didn't get it. But what they're telling me is they don't want to get it. Because they understand that fundamentally there's going to be some denial involved big time in your service to your love service to the Master. And, and they thought about denial and they just don't like the idea of denial. The young rich ruler was told that if you want to get into heaven, you can't be baptized while you're filthy rich and hoarding cash. It's impossible to, to repent and be baptized and to be hoarding. You can't do it. Now you can liquidate your cash like Zacchaeus did. You can liquidate your money. But you're going to have to liquidate it because a camel can't go through the eye of a needle. You can't be Mr. Fat Cash and get into heaven. It'll, it'll never happen. That's what the master was telling 
the young rich ruler. He wanted to offer himself as a servant and go into heaven, so he asked the master, what must I do in service in order for me to get in the door? Point blank conversation. I want to get in the dough, as my buddy used to say. And the master told him, love your mother, which you already did. You already told us that you took care of your mother. So you did love your mother. Good news. But we have one more commandment for you, Mr. Greedy Man. Liquidation is required here. Blessed are the poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. So if you want to get in the door, you're going to have to liquidate. And the man walked away sad because he didn't want to liquidate and he wanted to enjoy his money for a season and lose out eternity in heaven. And some people are willing to make that exchange. Here, Jeremiah is teaching you that we don't want you to think along those lines. We want you to think along the lines of being compliant to every area, to every word that proceeded from the mouth of God, because that gentleman wanted to, 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 to play pick a part with the will of the Lord. That's what he wanted to do. He, he wanted to be like a TV guy or something and play pick a part. I took care of my mommy, but I can go over here and be violent. Uh, I, 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 I'm nonviolent, but I am mean to my parents. When you come to Jesus Christ, he's going to confront you because he's pure as snow. He's going to confront you with your lifestyle. And if you're practicing any sin, he's going to confront you big time. And it can get very serious, just like it did with the young rich ruler. His soul was on the line. And he wouldn't exchange... Pleasure for 30 years, being rich, with, with a porta potty and servants uh, to hang around the guys who used the bathroom, probably in the woods, and ate off the ground, and slept with ants and wild critters. The Bible says that Moses thought about this exchange. The same thing that the young rich ruler thought about, the Bible says Moses thought about. I'm not going to go to that scripture right now. And Moses was wise. He did the opposite of the young rich ruler. He said, Lord, I'll be your servant. I'll take care of the Hebrews, even though we'll be in the desert, eating off the ground, and I'm going to leave the palace of the Egyptians where there's silk, wine, and parties. Moses thought about the future. He had foresight. He had wisdom. That's what the Bible says. The young rich ruler did not exercise wisdom by taking 30 years of pleasure to lose his soul. Jeremiah, sure, I'm to take a break here. We've been doing a lot of teaching here. We're going to move to 21 now. So we're looking at a few of the early teachings for the convert or the initiate that leads to salvation. So 21 is a point I want to make out, make to you about the Christian faith is, has a point or has a precept in it. One of the components of the Christian faith is, is that you're going to make an initiation, Paul calls it illumination, and you're going to operate. Initiate, get an office, and stay in the office. And your initiation and your partaking or your endurance, both of them were done properly. In a Christian, Protestant environment. Okay? Leading to salvation. Which means when you get saved, you are saved. But what did Paul say? We now live if we. So you are alive forever. But there's an if we or if after that. Right? I'm alive right now. But I'm alive if. Which means I can, I can, I can wipe myself out. Even though I am alive now. That gets to the word if, doesn't it? Yes. The master says if you continue. Jude said continue in the love of God. That's what that means. 
You have to continue in the love of God in order for you to be saved. That's the point. Because obviously, you don't have to continue in the love of God, even though you've been illuminated. We can go to, we can go to Hebrews and bring that point home even further. He who endures to the end shall be saved. So that's 21, which is leads to salvation, what you just got started, okay? Which means you are alive and you are saved. But there's a big point about doing what? Continuing to build. We're not going to go to the master's example of building, uh, where everybody saw a man building a house, and they went by a couple of weeks later, and he was just sitting there. That means you can build salvation and own it, and then quit. You know, and it's, it's, it's over. So we're building confidence. Let's go to 22. So we're building confidence, which is a persuasion uh, we, we, that, that we know that we're saved now, and we're back in the Garden of Eden, and Adam lost everything, but Adam's child is now back in the Garden of Eden again, where he won't die. And, you, we, and, we, and we got back to the Garden, and we're going to New Jerusalem, which is the same thing as the Garden of Eden, where there's no death, no pain, no crying. And we're going back to that again, and because we turned back, which, which goes back to the main point here of the word repentance. You turned back. That's the point of 22. Is you turned back, and you believe that it was worth it and wise for you to turn back to truth and reality and love, which you lost and your grandparents lost. You, 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 you decided that the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is a good deal. That, that's going to get you back to where you were before, and you're going to start speaking uh, uh, divine words, and you're going to start seeking, uh, getting back to the state of being, uh, and let it be so. Allowing, yielding, submitting. You have your way, Lord, and I'll just sit here. You tell me where to go, and I'll do it. That's what Israelite means. Full submission to Yahshua Jesus. Hallelujah. Israel. El means singular pronoun. The. Definite article. Same thing. There's only one the. The rest of us are them. You can see that when you look at the Hebrew and the names of the stars. We won't go into that right now. I didn't go into that in my recent star lesson of science. I let that go. I should have. I might have, no, let's not. I'll go into that maybe later. How the stars in the Bible always refer to God as a singular pronoun, definite article, all the time. Even Elohim has a singular pronoun. When God refers to people a lot, he uses indefinite pronouns like whosoever. But when he, when he refers to himself, it's a definite article every time. It's the mighty God. I had people knock on my door and said, he is a mighty God. So that means they changed the Bible. And that's dishonest people who are knocking on my door. They're the enemy of my soul and the ownership of my soul because I need to understand that you must worship the Son even as you worship the Father, which is in 20 here. Okay? That goes into deity, which goes into general doctrine, and more specifically, uh, that is Playlist 21 for you. I have some videos I'll be loading up for Playlist number 21, which talks about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and what's going on with them. In the Bible. I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you that, okay? Share that with you. Now we're on 22 right now, which is a turn, turning back. And you're confident that turning back and going in this direction and this path is beneficial for you. Where you're getting back into, I, I, I respect God for who he is. 
I have the fear of the Lord now. So let it happen. I acknowledge this role now. I, I acknowledge this role of me being the servant and loving God. And that's, what, that's the role I want to play now. That's what I want to do now. That's what I want to concentrate on now. I want to be devoted to that now. I've already confessed I'm a sinner. Jesus saves, and I'm in the process of being saved. Let's move on, and let's get into some Bible study, and let's, let's, go, let's move on. Let's go to 23. This is basic Protestant sound doctrine teaching, and it's called the Christian faith, and, and it, it is a belief in reality. 23 is basically, what is my belief in reality? And what doctrine do I belong to? And, and, and where do I fit? Well, first of all, you, you, you fit in the, the grammar here. Let's talk about this for a moment. Let me share, share this with you. It's grammar that you're interested in here. Having taught grammar for quite a few years, and, and uh, uh, I didn't really focus on grammar that much, as a teacher, um, but grammar is the key, one of the keys to life. When it comes to you understanding these words, and that's why I take a lot of time in definitions here, in defining words and context. That's why Playlist 10 is called Vocabulary and Context. Okay? Reality, grammar. So respect for the Creator and His commands that you lost, it's now good news now. You, now, you, you can now respect the Creator's demands all over again now. That your grandparents didn't do, you can go do that now. By the grace of God, you can live. An opportunity knocks. Opportunity knocks to believe on love, believe on care, to be confident that this love and this truth and this life that your grandparents left, you're going to now embrace it. And you're going to get saved. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. This is the wisest, the wisest path to take. You're going to sing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. You got it? One more point, I'm going to stop. 24 is basic Christian faith is based upon grace and mercy that came to each man so they could go back to Eden. That's called opportunity. You were grace and mercy to get back into uh, the lifestyle you needed to get back into, which was hungering and thirsting after righteousness and seeking the mercy of God when you came to God and when you make errors after you came to the Lord. So you're going to embrace reality and dump evil. And you're going to do that by the grace and mercy of God. It's basic Christianity that God came to each man and he brought them grace and mercy, which is an opportunity to love. And what are you going to do? You have all these flights of fantasy like a hippie. You know, oh, the purple trees and... You know, elephants fly and all the stuff out there in Babylon, you're going to dump. That's basic Christianity. We're talking about faith. And what is Christian faith? Well, I just went through a lot of points of what Christian faith is. And 24 is, you've been graced and mercy 
In other words, God's giving you the opportunity, even though he knows who you are and what you've done, for you to walk in back into Eden and go to heaven. And this grace and mercy is being afforded to basically every man. More specifically, to the 2,000-year covenant, to be saved instantly by offering yourself as a servant to Jesus Christ. And embracing the truth, because he is the truth. He is the amen. He is reality. He is wisdom. And you're going to start embracing that, and that's how we get everything going. You're going to dump evil. Bye, evil. Don't like you. Don't like you, evil. Bye-bye. All right. I think we did a good job on getting into this, and we're going to go to 5.2 which is really easy. Uh, 5.2 is very short. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, have, I think I have 5.3. Um, no, 5.3 is going to take some time. Remember, we're going over a lot of basics that you never get away from until you're in heaven. And even in heaven, we're going to sing about these ideas. God forgiving you and giving you a chance to be saved by you simply coming to the Son and kneeling and loving the Son. That's what the Father wants you to do. End of story. And you did that, and you got saved, and you're going to sing about that mercy that God showed you. Because he knew who you, he knew who you are, and yet he still came to give you life. And to love you, even though he knows who you are, that you'll never be perfect, and that you weren't perfect, and you did things to harm people, and you weren't kind, and you stole, and you did this, you did that, and he's going to shine it on, bro. Shine it on, Jeremiah. That's what mercy means. Shine it on, man. That's what he used to say in, in hippie days when I was growing up. That's how old I am. I, I remember 1969, 1970. They used to say, shine it on, bro. That means forget about it, man. I know you did something wrong. Just forget about it. And it takes a caring person to do that. To tolerate your, you know, your bad... Uh, 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 personalities and so forth and characteristics and what a good example of mercy in, in the Alexander Graham Bell documentary I saw last night where, where the daughter the father just kept harassing her about being late for dinner two minutes late and everybody in the family went along with daddy's rules about dinners at a certain time and, and they would show up a little late and they would, they would tolerate him going overboard on being two minutes late because that's not boots on the ground Christianity to bother people about small things. It's okay to teach discipline. The father was right. But the daughters and the daughters and the mother would just show up and hug their dad and go, okay, dad, okay. You're harassing us needlessly. And, 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 it's, and it's bothering us, but love tolerates a little bit of bothering. That's the end of Matthew chapter 5, and that's what's going to lead to adoption for all of us. That's where you get adopted, because that's the same thing Daddy does to us. What a wonderful story of love in a real American family, in a very wonderful situation, a wonderful family in, uh, in the east of... New England over there, New England, Boston. The daughter wore crosses, and, and the mother mentioned some scriptures and so forth. And it just it, it, that's what that's what makes America a great place. It, all of these Quakers around here. William Penn coming over here and starting a, starting a, a very big demographic uh, where people are forced, almost forced to force feed loving each other, whether you like it or not, or get out of town. Leave Pennsylvania. A lot of people hated the Indians when William Penn came here. He told them, you love the Indians, or basically leave Pennsylvania. Get, get out of town. Go to the south. William Penn's a very wonderful, interesting gentleman who basically started this country.
Some of his ideas are not biblical. I'm not going to go there right now. One of them is that God wants you to have some sort of utopia. That's not biblical. Now, is it biblical for you to start a country that has a constitution, that we have freedom of religion and, and love your neighbor as in, in, in the, the, the charter of the state of, the, of downtown? No, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Which is what been established. But as far as his theology and his teachings, no, a little bit off. We won't go into that. You know, you, you weren't made to have a place. William Penn's wife is the, is the one who actually started Pennsylvania. She never got to get over here. She died before she had a chance to come to Pennsylvania. She died very young. But William Penn, his wife told her, why don't you go start a new country? Since they won't leave you Quakers alone, the rich people, the evil people, the abusive people. So he said, good idea. I'll take my dad's money that the king has. He owes my dad money. Uh, he didn't pay him. I'll take that money and I start a new state in the United States. An entire demographic, geographical region that is 100% devoted to the freedom of religion and love your neighbor. The city of brotherly love. Unfortunately, she didn't get a chance to go. After he established the state, he went back to England for a while. As soon as he got off the boat, his wife was dying and she died which showed William Penn one thing, and I'm going to move on. It showed William Penn that into each life, the Lord has a cross. And there's no running away from it because you're going to run away from rich people in England who are abusive and proud. He went to go establish a place where there was no cross, and he came home to a cross. It doesn't mean what he did was wrong. That's not my point. It's okay for someone to establish a city or a state where you teach brotherly love. There's nothing wrong with that at all. The problem is, is that part of the Quakerhood was we're going to establish a place so that everybody can live in peace, so, so to speak, and that's not the way it is. Uh, William Penn should have stopped right there. We're going to establish a, 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 a country, more or less, where everybody is told in, in, the, in the charter, uh, uh, downtown, love one another, and we have a law, and thou shalt not murder, and th those are the laws of the land. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But to say that God wants everybody to live in peace and harmony uh, every day of their life based upon our energies, that's called eh, wrong answer. Because the Lord has promised tribulation to every convert. So you have to balance out your political, social, uh, uh, biblical perspective. Very similar to Republicans now on TV, who are generally Christian people who are trying to establish a place where there is no tribulation. Now some of them understand you can't establish a place without tribulation because God has called you to tribulation. There's nothing wrong with Republicans getting together to establish a, a, a more perfect union. Nothing wrong with that at all. With a Bill of Rights and so forth, and, and a preamble that, that God created all people equal, and they're endowed by their Creator with certain civilian rights and all of that. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to watch out how you word this declaration. Because they didn't word it properly. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, they didn't do a great job on wording the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. They did a fair job. They didn't do a good job. Because they put it in the preamble that God wants everybody to basically live some sort of hunky-dory, Republican, prosperous life, and that's not biblical. It contradicts the Master who says, I'm going to allow you to go through things that prophets went through in the Old Testament. Who's right, Benjamin Franklin or Jesus Christ? Uh, I'll let you make that decision. <laughs> the master is correct. Doesn't mean everything that Tommy said, oh, Jefferson and his buddies, 
Matthew Howard and uh, I think that was Thomas Jefferson's best friend and uh, and uh, uh, you know, give me liberty, give me death, boy, and John and Samuel Adams and not everything they were saying was wrong because because the English government was taking their property. You you have a right to be upset if somebody takes your property. Thomas uh, 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 Matthew Howard's uh, father-in-law got his property taken from him from England. And he, you know who he blamed? He, he blamed Thomas Jefferson for getting, for getting the king mad. No, the, the king took his money whether, whether Thomas Jefferson was uh, 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 making a revolt or not. Whether there was a Boston Tea Party or not, they, they, they were going to take his property. End of story. They basically took his property from him. He was handicapped, but we're done. We're going to go to 5.2 next, and 5.2 is going to be brief. Uh, I knew that 5.1 was going to be a lot of work, but I will not go over definitions anymore. Uh, we're going to go through the, the scriptures now, because I, I enjoy going through the scriptures more than uh, giving you definition and context, okay? Well, I want to use these numbers later on. For instance, baby, baby talk will be uh, 120. Okay? We'll refer to these. Okay? We're done. No more time for the day. I'm going to take the rest of the day off myself. I don't know what you're going to do. Maybe you have more Bible study, more work to do. Um, 5.2 is waiting for me here. It's easy as pie. I don't have 5.3 ready. Uh, I have old 5.3, let you know what's going behind the scenes. I have my old 5.3 ready to go, but I'll probably have to do it all over again because uh, when, when, usually when I do something again, it's better than it was before, sometimes. My revisions are aggrandizements, okay? Jeremiah is on fire, and he's rejoicing together with you in the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the presence of the Lord. There it is. Uh, uh, second, uh, First Thessalonians 2.17. In presence. There you go. Verse, verse 19. First Thessalonians 2.19. Even ye in the presence of of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Woo! There's the big enchilada right there. There's the big souffle. Uh, you know, there, there's the big, that's the big one right there. Out of all, the, we had faith lessons. We're in faith right now. Out of everything you believe in, that's the big one you believe in right there. We're going into faithing, that which is all the different things that you believe in. And the biggest thing you believe in, the most important, the most beautiful, is you, the rapture at the coming of the Lord. Woo! That's the big one. That's the thing that you expect out of all your expectations that you're really excited about. And we're really jazzed here, as we used to say back in the day. We're, we are really jazzed about what's getting ready to happen here. And you're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Snap, crackle, pop in a moment in, a, in the twinkling of an eye. Comfort one another with these scriptures of being with the Lord. Okay? And that goes right into the seg segues right into 5.2, which is how many different kinds of things are we believing in? How many different aspects of Christianity are we putting our confidence in? And, and, and there's, you know, I, I have 11 or 12 itemized here, so there's quite a few such as history, prophecy, uh, science creation. I'm having a lot of problems with people believing what the Bible says about science because uh, I think the enemy has done a good job of schooling people uh, into things that aren't the truth. And for those of you interested, I just, did a, I just did another overview of my science lessons that I have here for myself. I don't give you every science lesson I have. I, I, I gave you... And that's in uh, playlist 15, okay? 
Jeremiah shutting down stuff. We don't do too much. We're going to stop for the day. Maranatha and Shalom. Jerusalem. Beth Abara. Jordan. The Lord is going to descend and bring fire and test people to see if they're going to love him and humble themselves in his sight. That's what Jordan means. That's what Bethabara means. That's how you get into daddy's house. By aligning your brain with truth. Embracing what you didn't have confidence in before. Now we have confidence in something that's beneficial for us now. Which is the truth. God doesn't God does have to believe in the truth. He lives the truth every day and he never left the truth. He doesn't have to be reintroduced to the truth to say I'm confident that love is good. We have to do that. We have to say, wow, I was lost and now I'm found and now I know that love is the way to go and speaking the truth is beneficial and it's actually the best life to live. You got that? Boots on the ground, American gospel talk from Jeremiah here. <laughs> now when we get to scripture, I'm going to get away from a lot of my own exegesis and so forth. We're going to get heavy into scriptures here coming up. I look forward to that. I'm already, I've already started on blessed, and I'm going to continue with blessed, and I might have blessed part two. <laughs>